So I told y'all this was going to be a three-part conversation, so you're stuck with me for one more. Welcome to the three of you. Thank you. Um, part two of our conversation on terrorism is look, talking to three people who are experts in the security architecture of cities, who are thinking about you know, the, the wider terrorism threat and radicalization, as our last panel was, but thinking, what, what concretely should we do about it? How does that inform how we should build our cities, how we should live in our cities, and how do we strike a balance for mayors, for other civic leaders, for all of us who live in the cities, between trying to preserve the principle of an open democratic society with one where we can all safely live uh, and move around as citizens. So welcome to the three of you. Um, we are gonna switch back and forth a little bit between English and French, so if you have headsets, you may want to hear them because Colomb from uh, the Paris mayor's office is gonna be answering some in French, so you might wanna stick your headset in so we can hear that. I, I'm gonna start, we'll kind of go down the line, but I wanna start with you, Tom. Um, you have experience designing cities and how we should be thinking about this, both here in Europe and uh, in DC, where I live. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to read something that you wrote and let you tell me what me meant. You just gave an interview to Forbes recently and you said, the front line in terrorism is now streets and squares, promenades, schools, courthouses, places of worship, architects are on the front line. What do you mean by that? I mean, it sounds like you're describing yourself as a, as a combatant. Is that how it feels? You know, it does sometimes. I think, I think it's fair to say, um, despite what Mr. Keppel had to say and what others have said, that what we think of as the front lines, uh, the military, the police, and the intelligence services have had great difficulty in um, deterring people who are determined to attack and willing to lose their lives in the process. Uh, many of the people who perpetrated the worst attacks in France were fiché S. They were already known to the intelligence services. It's very difficult to monitor uh, this situation. So what I mean is that uh, the public square, the civic infrastructure, becomes the front line against this kind of attack. And I think that that means uh, uh, we've got to sort of rethink our urban planning and our outlook on places where large groups of people concentrate. And uh, that's what I mean by uh, being architecture on being lines. on the front line. Well, let me bring in some of the voices who are on the front lines here in Europe. Coulomb, you're a deputy mayor here in Paris, where you have an interesting project underway right now, trying to secure the Eiffel Tower. Pulling up, for those of you who haven't had the chance to see it yet, um, on this visit, you're putting up bulletproof glass around the Eiffel Tower. Tell us what the thinking is and what that's going to look like and how it will change the way that visitors to the city and those of you who live here will interact with maybe your most famous monument. D'abord, ça va être très beau, rassurez-vous. Ça va être très beau parce que ce que nous avons aujourd'hui comme dispositif de sécurisation de la Tour Eiffel est très objectivement très laid. C'est un dispositif de sécurisation qu'on a installé après un certain nombre d'événements qui nous ont imposé de renforcer le niveau de sécurité. Et donc, dans l'urgence, pour pouvoir assurer aux visiteurs et à l'ensemble de ceux qui travaillent à la Tour Eiffel, on a mis en place des palissades. Et nous sommes maintenant obligés de réfléchir la ville, mais vous le disiez aussi en termes architectural, en intégrant la question de la sécurité et de la sécurisation. Et donc, il y aura une enceinte vitrée avec un dispositif de vitre qui empêche les balles de passer, qui permettra d'avoir en même temps une vision sur la Tour Eiffel pour ne pas cacher la Tour Eiffel. Elle appartient à tous les Parisiens et à tous les touristes, et en même temps pouvoir assurer des conditions de visite et euh, l'organisation de queues en extérieur qui permettent euh, cette sécurité. On voit bien que sur les grands monuments, la Tour Eiffel est évidemment le, le, le phare de Paris de ce point de vue-là, mais aussi sur les questions de sécurité au quotidien, Nous sommes aujourd'hui, comme élus, obligés de penser la ville avec une dimension qui n'existait pas ou pas autant avant euh, notamment euh, les attaques terroristes de novembre 2015 à Paris. Okay. The challenge, of course, is that 
we can't build bulletproof glass like, uh, around everything that we would like to protect. And uh, Severine, I want to ask you about your work uh, with the European Union, thinking about this from the perspective of all of the different member states. And fabulous timing for us, the EU was working on new guidelines for member states on exactly this question, trying okay. to balance keeping things accessible and open in democracies with keeping us safe. Tell me, can you give us any preview of what those guidelines are going to sure. look like? Actually, we just issued uh, last week on 18 of October a new action plan on the protection of public spaces. Just first of all, to start, I want to say that the Commission is here to help and support member states. We're not in first place. It's, it's you, the local authorities, the mayor, the member state are first in line to protect citizens. But we're here to help. And how can we help? So we did this action plan, three main things that we can do to help the local, the regional, national level. It's first of all financing, because this costs a lot of money. Uh, it's quite expensive, this new design, security architecture, so we can help with finance. We can also help with guidance and best practice, because we realize that many cities have, of course, the same challenge around Europe. So what we're trying to do is to build up networks of experts on different specific themes, uh, so that they can exchange best practice will also create specific guidance material on, for example, protecting crowded spaces, on security by design, so exactly on new architecture for the cities, because we want to have the public space stay public and stay open. So we think that there's new things you can do in the future for that, and that's why we're also financing research projects on that under a specific European program called Horizon 2020. We're already financing 45 research projects specifically on keeping cities safe and at the same time open spaces. So there's a lot we do uh, on this action plan. We can go in more detail later on if you want. But let me, I'm going to ask all three of you just to get specific in terms of how we should be thinking about this. I mean, one of the things that people are debating is should we close cities to traffic? Mm -hmm. Is that just where we are headed? no cars, no trucks, you know, with all of the implications that we get that that would have for commerce. Um, or should we be asking people to go through more security checkpoints, metal detectors, before they enter a train station or a stadium or a hotel like this? So let me ask you, just Severine, if, let me start with you. You can speak for yourself or speak for how the EU is thinking sure. about this, but what are some of the specific things cities should be grappling for, from with? The, from the EU perspective, I mean, we see many different solutions taken by cities, so we have this overall European perspective on that. I can see that there is many new de technological development that enables us not to do that. For example, we were in Nice um, with a commissioner in September where 60 cities came together to talk about this issue and sign the declaration and they showed us the new things they had put into place in Nice on the promenade after the attacks and you can see that it's effective to pr for protection but at the same time it doesn't change really the nature of the environment and I think that by working with architects, by working with the local level to see the specific needs, we can, we can do this kind of project that combine both. So I think we can find a middle ground between closing off everything and having the security for our citizens. But for that, we, the Commission, we really need your input on the local level, on the ground, to see what the good project we should finance, what are the new research we should finance, because we're really above everything that. So we really need this feeding from the ground, and that's why it's very important for us to discuss with local levels and architects and designers and everything. Colombe, how is this debate unfolding here in Paris? What are some of the hard trade-offs that you're thinking about? Pour répondre à votre question, il faut repartir euh, du constat. Paris est une ville dans laquelle vivent 2 millions 200 000 habitants qui sont attachés à un art de vivre parisien. J'espère que vous avez pu le, le découvrir les uns les autres. Et Paris est en même temps une ville qui accueille tous les ans 30 millions de touristes. Et évidemment, une dimension de sécurisation qui euh, aujourd'hui est euh, impérative. Et donc on doit arriver à un subtil équilibre dans lequel nous ne lâchons rien sur les questions de sécurité. Vous parliez euh, de la tour Eiffel, mais évidemment, Ces questions, ces aménagements sont maintenant des questions et des aménagements qui existent sur tous les grands lieux touristiques de Paris, dans lesquels 
des aménagements de voirie, tels que ceux que Séverine décrivait sur euh, la promenade des Anglais, mais évidemment la présence de policiers, parce que c'est aussi un dispositif humain et pas uniquement un dispositif technique, doivent exister tout en permettant aussi que Paris reste une ville dans laquelle on peut faire la fête, dans laquelle on peut pique-niquer dans les jardins ou euh, sur les bords de Seine, et dans laquelle on doit continuer à garder un espace public qui soit un espace commun. Et je crois que c'est ça le principal défi qui s'impose à nous, les villes, les élus, c'est d'arriver à garder des espaces publics qui soient des espaces communs et partagés, tout en acceptant le fait que cela impose de la présence humaine de policiers, des aménagements de voirie, parfois des contrôles. Si euh, vous allez vous promener euh, sur euh, Paris-Plage l'été, lorsque euh, les bords de Seine sont rendus euh, à euh, la promenade et aux activités ludiques, eh bien, il faudra accepter d'ouvrir votre sac. Mais voilà, il faut être sur ce subtil équilibre. Et puis, parce que c'est notre responsabilité euh, d'élu, il faut aussi assurer la sécurisation de nos propres bâtiments municipaux, parce que Paris est une ville qui accueille des enfants dans les écoles, et donc nous avons dû aussi nous reposer la question de la sécurisation des écoles. Et là, vous vous dites, mais ça n'a rien à voir avec le sujet. Si, parce que devant une école, vous avez un trottoir, et le trottoir doit rester un lieu devant lequel les parents doivent pouvoir venir chercher leurs enfants, mais aussi échanger et discuter entre eux. Et donc, vous voyez qu'on est vraiment sur des aménagements qui doivent laisser cette spontanéité et cette euh, envie de vivre ensemble, tout en maintenant, évidemment, des aménagements qui protègent, y compris, par exemple, devant les écoles, en empêchant que des voitures stationnent. Tom, jump in and tell us how you think about this. Are there things cities should be considering, things we should absolutely rule out? What's Paris has its, like? its origins in medieval history, the Paris yeah. we see today, and it was constructed for security, originally. You can still mm -hmm. see certainly vestiges of the first walls and then the right. walls of Thiers mm -hmm. you can see on the exterior so you still see the doors. The city is filled like so many cities are with what I would call secure enclaves like this hotel. You're inspected when you come in but you're out on the street and when you cross that threshold there's something that happens to scrutinize you. We should be thinking about precincts, larger segments of cities. This is what's happened in London. This is what's happened in lower Manhattan in New York. It's happened around the White House in Washington, with which I'm very familiar. You two helped things, work on that project. I did. Uh, two things I want to talk about. First, uh, security is above all a human enterprise, and it involves uh, maintaining scrutiny and the interest in the environment that's being secured. It's very difficult for security mm -hmm. personnel to maintain interest and to continually engage with people if they're not moving around and in a position to sort of take ownership of the area that they're responsible for. Technology can be an enormous help with that. We have now uh, software that's linked with video cameras, for example, in a subway platform. It can determine if someone is running too quickly. It can determine if there's a sound that's out of the ordinary. It can determine if something has been left. It learns the environment, it learns what's normal, and it sends alerts to humans when something is out of the ordinary. These are tools we can use as designers. I think uh, if you look at the Ring of Steel in London, for example, they cut... And just briefly describe yeah. what that is for people who... Uh, an area around the city of London, it's a vestige from the Bishopsgate bombing, which was an enormous bomb, uh, truck bomb exploded, um, uh, perpetrated by the IRA at the time, and in the aftermath, they cut the number of entries to the city of London, the financial center of London, from 37 to 9. And every one of those nine is watched. Vehicles entering and leaving are watched. License plate recognition technology has helped that. Uh, lower Manhattan, uh, after the World Trade Center bombings, a similar principle, fewer ways in for large vehicles, more scrutiny on the way in. And around the White House, which I know best, um, there are six ways in for pedestrians. How many people here have been to Lafayette Square and around the White House? Well, quite, quite a number. So anybody walking in, their comportment is evaluated, what they're wearing, what they're carrying. There is somebody watching the people as they enter. It's unobtrusive. It tends to be uniformed Secret Service personnel, some non-uniformed. 
they rotate so they're not bored all day long being in the same place and they're able to evaluate the people approaching and assess what their intent is at a first level. It still feels open if you've been there. Uh, the White House itself does not, but the grounds surrounding it. And that's another principle, this idea of layers and successive layers. Uh, there will be improvements on the ellipse to the south of the White House that will enhance its security in the same manner, reducing the number of ways people can enter. Uh, using landscape elements, benches, and things of that nature to prevent automobiles from being able to That are to bollards but don't look like big ugly posts. That's right. Posts. And uh, you will see in various parts of Washington uh, streetscape elements that have been introduced that have that objective. So they're less obtrusive, less unsightly, less ugly. Uh, and, I, and I think this is the way forward uh, is to look at precincts. One of the examples that somebody in the audience was mentioning to me this morning was uh, in London at Arsenal Stadium that they spell the name yes. Arsenal out in front of the stadium and it looks really cool and the fans just think, oh, that's my team. But it's, it's a, a security barrier. barrier. You, can't, yeah. you can't drive over that. It would stop a truck. We're going to take audience questions in one second. I just want to give each of you a really quick rapid fire. Is there a city that does this really well and why in a sentence or two that we should learn from and be looking at as an example? Somebody, I don't know, like the Arsenal example I just mentioned, but something that you're looking at and thinking, oh, that's a good idea. I might want to try that. Any of you? Mm, no, I mean, the, the only example I've seen like so far was Nice, so that's the most current example, and I saw it before and after, and I think it's a good example, um, because really it, it, it blends in, it doesn't change the nature of the public space, but they showed us how technological this was, and that was quite impre impressive. I think the, the use of advanced technology and those new way of protection is quite impressive, and, and that's why I think cities can learn and learn from that, but as I said before, it's expensive. So yeah. we're yep. here to, to help financing because we see the cost, and that's why also you need to work at EU level on that, because if you finance those research at 28, you're much bigger and better than if you finance each member state the same research. So we want to have those cross-European projects that can finance those research and enable all cities to make use of them. So. Well, you're raising quite <laughs> rightly the, the, a third pillar here. It's not just about having open democratic spaces and secure spaces, but it's really expensive, some of the things you need to do to change that. Very quick answer from either of you. Je me méfie du bon exemple dont on devrait tous s'inspirer. Par contre, je pense qu'on peut prendre de bons exemples partout. Moi, j'ai été très impressionnée, même si euh, il, ça date déjà un peu, du travail qui a été fait autour de la résilience avec les habitants de New York après le 11 septembre. Cette euh, comment dire, capacité de la ville de New York de travailler très largement avec euh, des dizaines de milliers de New Yorkais tout de suite mais aussi dans le moyen et le long terme pour travailler à la résilience d'une ville. Ça, par exemple, c'est quelque chose dont nous souhaitons nous inspirer à Paris pour que les habitants soient au cœur du processus de résilience. On ne construira pas ou on ne permettra pas à une ville comme Paris d'être résiliente si on ne le fait que par les institutions, par le bâti, par l'architecture, mais si on oublie d'y associer les habitants. C'est eux qui y habitent, c'est eux qui doivent être au cœur. Et par exemple, j'ai trouvé que ce qui avait été fait par la ville de New York, il y a de cela quelques mm. années, était un exemple vraiment intéressant dont nous pouvons nous inspirer, dont d'ailleurs nous nous inspirons. That is interesting. Okay, one audience question. Anyone? I see. Right here. Hi. Dr. Vishal Rao from India. I had a question to the expert panel. Is poverty a greater incentive than ideology for terrorism? Hmm. I'm not sure Did I heard the question. That? No. the question. One more time with the mic up. Is, is poverty a greater incentive than ideology for terrorism? Mm. From, from the experts, what do you feel? <sighs> I'm, I'm afraid that's a little out of my league. I, uh, mm. I would like to add to what the deputy mayor had to say. I think every major city in the world is dealing with this issue, and there are good examples from every place. Let's not forget that when you say New York, you probably mean Manhattan, and it is an island. Uh, okay. And um, not every city is an island. If you look at the typical American city, mm -hmm. Oklahoma City, for example, Los Angeles, it goes on forever. There are no natural porthole, portals or barriers or things that can be controlled, so it's a very different thing. 
I would say about poverty that um, if it is a place where terrorism is allowed to develop, uh, if, if w those populations harbor um, these things, which has had happened in French cities, um, they may pay unfairly for it, and um, that's something we really need to be cognizant of and sensitive to, it seems to me. Thank you. Well, lots of different themes there to leave us on, thinking about cities as islands or not, cities with medieval maze layouts designed to yeah. keep intruders out versus a lot of new American cities designed to foster commerce and traffic through. Colom, Severin, and Tom, thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks very much. <laughs>